Steiner has developed something that he calls spiritual economy. And it turns out that the reincarnation process isn't quite so simple either. The spiritual world is such that when certain etheric bodies or astral bodies have been developed and worked upon, and individuals have worked upon them and developed and really created something, they're stored up within the astral world. They're not just dispensed with. And copies can be made of them. So copies are made of the etheric bodies of each of these initiates, and sort of Manu takes this group with him, and it's almost like uh, giving them, I suppose, a communion meal. Somehow he gets these etheric bodies into them. Steiner's very vague about a lot of these details. They get these etheric bodies into them, and suddenly they have clairvoyant abilities. And now they can see into the astral plane, and they have an intellect, which is something that the Elanians did not have. And um, just as an aside, Steiner, for example, says uh, uh, that uh, the etheric body of Zoroaster was inherited by Hermes, the founder of the Egyptian civilization, whereas Moses inherited the astral body of Zoroaster. The etheric body has to do with being able to see. That's the other way around, actually. Moses inherited the etheric body because the etheric body enables you to see into the clairvoyant world. And Moses' writing the book of Genesis was supposedly his ability to use the etheric body of Zoroaster to see into the spiritual world, whereas uh, there was a more technological emphasis with Hermes and the Egyptian civilization, and the astral body uh, apparently stores up a more sort of technical uh, basis. And he also says Copernicus inherited Nicholas of Cusa's etheric body, because Nicholas of Cusa had an early intuition of the heliocentric solar system before Copernicus did, about a century before. Nobody's sure how he came by it, but uh, Steiner says it was because he inherited So, as in the Buddhist tradition, the subtle body can split up and parts of it can go to other individuals if they have been highly developed. And he also says that if an individual, this is crucial to his theory of the incarnation, if an individual has within him the presence of one of these divine beings, an avatar, it enables copies to be made of that person's etheric body. And he says that Shem, for example, the ancestor of the Hebrews, had within him an avatar that enabled him copies of his etheric body to be distributed to all the Hebrews, and so through the transmission of the bloodline. And so they've all sort of received the copies of the etheric body of Shem. But Christ is an avatar who does something different. We'll look at that uh, in a bit here. So anyhow, the gist of it is that uh, this migration of people moves from about the area of Ireland, somewhere in there, and they move east. And they establish the foundations for the first post-Atlantean epoch. And of course, there are seven of those. And um, the first post-Atlantean epoch is the Hindu culture center. And now he's specific about dates. He says the Atlantean catastrophe happened in 7227 BC. And that's about coterminous with the birth of the prehistoric Indian civilization. Now he says this is not the Hindu civilization that we think of. It's a prehistoric one. It's the early, early rudiments of Indian civilization, which begins to come in in 7227 BC and lasts until 5067 BC. And the task of the Hindu civilization, now the Atlanteans, notice, have developed the physical body. They've solidified it. But now the etheric body has to be developed within the human species. So the, the task of the Hindus was to develop this etheric body. They never really developed the astral body because Steiner says the reason why there's such an emphasis in Indian mysticism on uh, quelling the passions and desires and getting rid of all of that is the Hindus never really got a sense of the astral body, but the etheric body was something that they got. And they were able to see into the etheric world and they saw the whole outer world as maya, as illusion, as something that was essentially not real. So the outer world was not real for them. And then the Hindu civilization gets off and going, uh, and it lasts for that period. Then we move to the second post-Atlantean culture epoch, which is the Persian. And again, we've got these absurdly ancient prehistoric dates, but the dates that he gives are 5067 BC for the Persian, going down to uh, 2907 BC. And as you can see, they're about 2,000 years each, and that'll be significant for the Platonic month. Um, 5067 to 2907. And now he says uh, the special mission of the Persian peoples was to bring in a development of the astral body. And this is why in Persian dualism, now remember that uh, the emphasis on Brahman in India uh, is kind of emphasis on the one. We said that that was about equivalent to Plotinus's idea of the one. 
And Snyder says the Hindu epoch, in a certain sense, links back to all the sun before there were any planetary schisms, before the sun and the moon split into two planetary bodies. So that kind of, the Hindus are sort of in resonance with old sun, with that single sun that the archangels sort of lit up, and that their emphasis on the oneness is in resonance with that. Then he says that the Persian mythology of the separation, you know, you have this, this sort of, um, you have the god of light, or a Mazda, and then Araman is the god of darkness, and that split between darkness and light between matter down here and the spiritual world up above is, Steiner says, a recapitulation of old moon, of the separation on old moon between sun and uh, the earth moon body. And remember we saw the, the dualism between the more spiritual in the sun and the more dense and material on the earth plus moon during old moon. So they've sort of tapped into this. Zoroaster is the primary prophet here. And uh, he evolves this religion. They develop the astral body. Remember, the astral body has to do with passions and desires. And um, in a certain sense, Steiner's dates I don't think are very good ones. But in a certain sense, the Persian civilization represents an improvement over the Hindus, but also a rejection of India. I mean, if you go from uh, the, the real dates for India, classically anyway, are 1500 BC, thereabouts, you can push it back to Mohenjo-Daro, to the prehistoric period of about 2500 BC. Uh, but the, with the Aryans coming in and building the caste system and all that, that all begins about 1500 BC. Uh, and the Persians normally date from about 1000 BC, the academic dates for Persia. And there's a debate about whether Zoroaster lived 1000 BC or whether he lived 500 BC. But I think the evidence speaks for 1000 BC because the Gathas, which are the, the Zoroastrian sacred texts, are very similar in their language to Sanskrit. So the two can't have been very, that far apart, 500 Hindu idea of going off into the forest alone and practicing meditation is bunk. It's not something that should be done. What you need to be interested in is society and helping to improve society in its attempt at a restoration of the good. There has been this cosmic fall, the separation of light from darkness, and it is the task of us as individuals to participate within the ethical world of what Zoroaster says is the good, you know, following right conduct, right this, right that following those rules and eschewing that whole Hindu idea of t turning away from society. So you can already see the West is coming in here in its uh, sort of rejection of the East. Sort of even geographically there's the dividing line between India and Persia there. And um, the other thing about uh, is there's an intentional inversion because what are uh, Asuras in India becomes, those are the devils, becomes Ahura Mazda, the god of light, the sun god. And Steiner says that the Zoroastrian worship of the sun god was really the Christ being that they were worshiping. The Christ being is the sun god, and cultures which worship sun gods were actually recognizing the Christ being. And Divas, which are the Hindu divinities, are now devils in this system. The language has been intentionally inverted to sort of invert the value systems. So the Persians explicitly are rejecting the Hindu worldview. Uh, so in a certain sense, Steiner's got, uh, he's got this right uh, from that uh, perspective. Then we get into the uh, Egyptian civilization, which is the third post-Atlantean epoch. And of course, the Egyptian civilization, as we know it, is much older than the Hindu. And so much of what we know about India can be documented as having been originated in Egypt, so that Egypt should be first. But even before Egypt, of course, we ought to have Sumer. There's a lot that the Egyptians have borrowed from the Sumerians, but nobody knew about the Sumerians yet. And uh, so we have uh, the Egypto-Chaldean civilization coming in here at uh, 2907 BC, which is about right, actually, 3000 BC for the Egyptian civilization. That date's about correct. And that goes, uh, what is my date for that? 747 BC. 